What's up, guys? Welcome to Running Things Season 2, Episode 4. My name's Riley. I'm your host. I'm also the editor over at tempojournal.com. Thanks for being with us today. I feel like I say this every week, but we really do have an amazing episode lined up. So whether you are listening to the podcast, maybe out on a long run, or whether you are watching on YouTube, it's great to have you with us. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube show, or if the podcast is your vibe, make sure you subscribe to the pods as well. Now, we always do have pretty big names on the show, but uh, this one's really special. You know, to be honest, if I owned a shirt and tie, I would be wearing it right now out of respect for our guest. Maybe you want to whack one on before you listen or watch the rest of this show. I am, of course, talking to the 2016 Rio Olympic gold medalist, the 2019 Doha world champ, the world record holder in the 400 hurdles. She actually owns three of the fastest 10 times ever in that event. We are talking, of course, with Dalila Muhammad all the way from Los Angeles in California. I don't want to waste too much of your time on an intro or on other stuff today because it really is an amazing chat with Dalila. She talks a bit about her mindset and how she goes about achieving like these incredible feats and, and, and getting these incremental improvements nonstop in her performances. Also talks a little bit about what it means to be a role model for so many young athletes around the world. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with Dalila Muhammad. All right, guys, super exciting episode today. As you know, it's big names only here on Running Things, and today they do not get any bigger than this woman. Rio gold medalist, broke her own world record last year, world champ, the amazing Dalila Muhammad. Dalila, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hey, it's uh, it's amazing to have you on. Uh, where, where are we talking to you from today? Where are you? Los Angeles, California. And it's uh, it's mid afternoon, late afternoon. Run yeah. us through a day in the life of Dalila Muhammad. Oh well, things look a little different, I think, right now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, actually, it's my off season right now. I think that I'm gonna say what is uh, September. So September is normally my off off season. So right now, it's not much going on. <laughs> just waking up. You know, normally I'd be training, but since I'm not training right now, it's just me getting up and. Funny enough, I've been doing a lot of different kind of Zoom calls. So that's kind of like what my life looks like, you know, waking up, getting ready for a Zoom call and communicating with people that way. I think uh, it's kind of what it's like to be an office worker right now around the world, right? Like just uh, endless Zoom calls and work from home. Exactly. Definitely just working from home, a different type of work from home. Um, I'm going to start getting back into the weight room in a little bit, but right now I'm just really enjoying this time off. I think... It's important as runners that we just kind of take that time to just kind of decompress and do absolutely nothing. So that's what I'm doing right now, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> um, you said you're in off season. So when you kind of when you kind of transition out from kind of intense training into off season, like you know, normally if it's last year, you you do that after say USA's, and then you build back up to Doha. And and this year, obviously, we would have liked to have had a Tokyo and then go into an off season, but how does it feel going into an off season now after a a very strange 2020? Do you, is there much for you to reflect on or how, how does that feel? You know what? That's a really good question. I think there isn't much to reflect on. I think I just tried to make the most that I possibly could out of this year and just kind of use this time to kind of just refocus my mind and just kind of refocus what my goals were and what I really wanted um, after 2019 season, you know, I was just kind of, it felt rushed anyway to kind of, after such a long 2019 season to kind of get into an Olympic cycle. And I definitely felt rushed and just having to like mentally handle everything that happened the year prior and then get ready for Olympic season. So I just use this time to kind of, I guess, refresh my mind and re rejuvenate, I would say. And just kind of refocus on what the goal is. And I think so. It's not so, too much reflection going on. It's just me kind of getting my body right um, physically, making sure that I'm no lagging injuries and just really getting ready to have a hard training session once fall comes. I want to, um, I want to kind of start by kind of going all the way back to, to college days, your time at USC. Like, with everything that you've achieved now and the position you find yourself in in the sport as the defending Olympic champion, you set the world record last year at USA's, then you broke it again in Doha, you're the world champion. When we look at your college career, you had a 
you had a good college career. You know, I think you're. I think you finished third at NCAA's in two thousand and nine, and and you were kind of around the mark for the rest of your your collegiate career. But I don't think you know. I don't even think a lot of experts would have said during college, "Hey, this this Dalila Muhammad is going to win gold," and you know all these accolades. <laughs> I know. I'd agree. But with what you. about you? Is that yeah? Did you kind of always think that this is where things would end up? Did you always have that belief? <sighs> It's hard to say. I want to be, you know, say yes, but I think that's kind of not true. I think as athletes, we, we kind of always want to be like, you know, you got to believe in yourself and no, if no one else does. But I think, you know, definitely those college years, it was a, definitely a lot of doubt. Um, as a high, high school runner, I always kind of thought that. But um, as college years, I think that's where it kind of goes dark for me. And it's just those those doubt that you have and I think I just really struggled with that a lot in college. Just a lot of, lot of doubt. Um, so yeah, it didn't really plan out, I guess, my college years, how I thought they would. And um, funny enough, I think in 2019, after winning Athlete of the Year, I'm, I even looked at myself, I'm like, how did I get here? Like, <laughs> where, like, how did this come about? Like, just knowing like all the struggles that I have been through in the past. So it was definitely... Um, I don't even know if I say surprising. I know the work that I put in, but it definitely, there was some doubt there, I think, during those college years. And I don't think that I thought that it would happen. It just one year, I just decided that I really wanted it to happen and I would do everything possible to make it happen. And it really just changed things drastically for me. And it, it is, you know, your kind of, your progression and, you know, everything that you've achieved now, it really is. It's a great story for younger athletes and maybe the, the athletes who coming out of high school or, or in the early stages of their career, they're not always winning the races. They're not always at, at the top of the heap that, you know, like this kind of fairy tale um, career that you're having, you know, it comes through hard work and like, you know, that progression year by year and season by season, all of a sudden now you sit here, yeah, as the Olympic champ and, 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 you know, I think what's kind of surprising was that Doha was your first world champs, right? Like your first win in the world it was, champs when it was. people would have assumed, you know, that many years earlier. So, yeah, I think it's a really great story for young people that like, you know, not giving up and, and, and deciding you really want something can pay off. Yeah, absolutely. I love to kind of people. I don't feel like people really know that much that side of my story and just that struggle. Um, they kind of see that after the college, like me going as a pro athlete and those big wins that I've had, but they didn't, they don't really remember or everyone at least I'll say doesn't always remember those struggles that I really had during college. And, um, I'm just, I guess I'm, I really do one of those athletes that really believe anything is possible because it was possible for me. And I feel like why not, why can't it be possible? Anything that you want in life is achievable if you really, really work at it and, um, you just have to make those sacrifices. That's really all that it came down to for me was just making those drastic. And they were definitely drastic changes in my life that I made to achieve these goals, but definitely worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to fast forward now and talk about uh, USA's last year in Des Moines. I was actually lucky enough to be there that day working as as media. So I was, I was oh, nice. shooting that, that meet. And I remember... You know, the the weather for that race was, it was pretty wet. The track was certainly pretty wet. Um, there was a lot of talk sort of about yourself and Sid McLaughlin. And after the race, like, and I, I've, I've watched the race a bunch of times in the last few days, like your reaction. And I remember even on the day, like taking photos of you with the, with the, like the, the time and everything. It was obviously a big moment for you, but it, it didn't seem like it, 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 it almost felt like that was kind of part of the process for you, right? And I read this fantastic piece in Sports Illustrated from late last year, um, talking with your coach, and it it really cements that it that, that breaking the world record felt like that was the process, that was the plan. It I don't know if it was an expectation, but it was certainly something that you guys were definitely working towards. Um, how did it feel to to have your first world record? <laughs> you know, I think you put it perfectly. I think it for me. And I think I've been having a hard time articulating what that actually felt like. And because honestly, you feel so many different things in the moment. And 
leading up to that race, you know, just speaking to my coach, I felt really confident um, in my training, you know, the training that I had put in. And I really, truly believed that the world record was possible. Um, But you never know. And so many things can go wrong. And I just so I, I was kind of in a weird headspace. It's like, I wasn't trying to be overly excited, obviously, before the race, because I wanted to stay as calm as I possibly could. Obviously, I'm trying to make a world team. I'm, I'm even trying to win championships. I have huge competition and I'm trying to break a world record. So trying to <laughs> <laughs> have all of that and just kind of keep my composure it was me just really finding that headspace to not be overly excited about anything. And it was just what I'm here to do a job. Let's do it. I can celebrate, celebrate when it's over, but in the moment when it's, when it's done, you're just like, you're so relieved that you like, that you can let go that it it doesn't even come across that way. It just comes across (laughs) as me just like relieved more than anything. And that's like the honest feeling that I initially had. It's like, obviously I'm excited. I did it, but it's just that relief to like, let go of that pressure that you've been trying to ignore for so long. So, um, um, you spoke, you, 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 you mentioned like trying to stay really calm, you know, and not get too excited about things. How important is it in the days leading up to your race to have the right support team and the right people around you to kind of keep you like in the kind of a level, level heading? It's extremely important. I'm definitely the person that will ignore you if you're not, <laughs> if you're, if it, <laughs> I am and I, and I feel bad. And it's like, I'm so happy to have those people in my life that truly understands. So it's like, I'll speak to my coach. I'll speak to my training partners, but family, even my mom. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> hey, mom, gotta go. Bye. It's like, I keep the conversation short. And there's no, obviously I love my mother. I love my family, but it's just any, it's like you're so sensitive at that time and lit- any little thing is like it'll, it'll it'll upset you. It'll just take you out of your zone. And I just I'm that's I'm that person. I'm going to admit it. I'm definitely that person that will honestly ignore it or <laughs> just just push it off. I'll, I'll push it off. And I, I say I procrastinate. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of do that until I can give it my full 100 percent attention. Something I found like incredible there was a there was a pretty decent crowd that day in Des Moines and and obviously like the inclement weather and I read in the Sports Illustrated piece um that you could actually hear your coach say to you during the race like telling you to like drop your arms or like bring bring your arms down like how 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 does that even happen like I couldn't even hear myself think that day and you're you're able to like pick out your coach's voice I have absolutely no idea I think it's crazy the things that you hear when you're just, I guess we call it a zone. And I think we've, we've used that term loosely and people kind of, it can mean different things for different people, but I guess that's the best way I can describe it. It's like the things that it's like your brain can, I don't know. I think our brain is just honestly super powerful and it can pick up what we want in those moments. And for me, it was the footsteps. You can hear like the footsteps of those runners that, which you're not even exactly sure if that's exactly what you're hearing, but that's what it translates to you. And his voice is like a distinct voice that I can pick out in a crowd as well. So how that's possible, I don't know, but it seems Crazy. like the rest of the world is silent. So it seems like it's silent. I don't even know if it is. I have to rewatch the video to tell you, but it <laughs> feels silent. And, and those are the, I'm able to, you know, pick up on the sounds that I want to hear or that my brain is trying to find. Mm. Um, now, Des Moines, lovely city, not, um, you know, it's not, it's not like the biggest city in the world, but, uh, like my first time in Des Moines last year, we were, you know, me and some buddies, we were pretty excited. One night we were out for dinner and we saw Justin Gatlin at Cheesecake Factory, right? So that was a big deal for us. <laughs> and then uh, the next night we saw Bowerman at uh, at a little restaurant called Zombie Burger. Again, pretty nice. exciting. How do, but I want to know how, when you break a world record at USA's, how do you celebrate? Was that Was that like a really special night for you and the team? It was honestly, I, I, <laughs> I don't, I did go out that night after because I'm like, you know what, I have to celebrate. I have to like walk the town, but I like, and I was so gracious. I'm so thankful to all the people, but literally I couldn't walk a block and it, I loved it. It was great, but just the amount of people that were kind of coming up to me saying, congrats, 
Um, so it was, it was, wasn't even what I expected for, I don't even know why I didn't expect that, but, um, it definitely wasn't what I expected. So I did celebrate with, you know, honestly, probably the whole city of Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Now I want to, I want to go to Doha. I mean, you only had a couple of months between USA's and, and Doha to kind of reload for the world champs. How, how do you spend that time? Because Des Moines was late July and then, and then Doha was early October. So what was the plan for you guys in that, in that kind of eight to 10 weeks? Oh man, I think it was really just coming home was the plan to just kind of come home. I know we had some races in between that. So so to run those races, we had to run the Diamond League final and kind of get ready for that. But our focus was always going to be Worlds and we'd run those races. Um, But the focus was really, really for Worlds. But luckily enough, we had the opportunity to go to Amsterdam. And so And that was honestly the best thing, possible decision we could have ever made, just having that change of scenery for training and just kind of just being able to refresh and train out there and also just kind of enjoy that time and not even think about the world record, not even think about worlds, but just kind of enjoying the training and just enjoying um, a new atmosphere. So that was really like a really good thing that we did, Um, me, my training partner, and my coach. All right. Dalila, I want to go to the the final in Doha. Pretty stacked field, as you would expect in a World Champs final. But your your race, certainly to an outsider, looked pretty clinical. Like your your third hundred meters, especially, was was uh, was pretty special. And and obviously, you held off a fast finishing Sid McLaughlin, and again, you know, broke a world record that you had only set, you know, eight or ten weeks prior. Again, you looked pretty sort of composed after the race. How did you, how do you reflect on the Doha final? Um, I guess I'd say it kind of went to plan. I think um, we, and I say we, me and my coach, we definitely, obviously I wanted to win the race. And I think that was for me the, the goal and definitely what I was going after. Um, Sometimes I think you just kind of get lucky too and things go to plan. I I try to be extremely clinical. I think that's a great word to use in training. And I'm like very, very anal about hitting my splits like exactly and being able to do it um, under pressure and being able to do it when I want to do it and not kind of focusing like on the race um, or what's going on around me and still being able to hit those times versus if I'm tired, if I'm on fresh legs, like what these splits feel like in multiple scenarios. So um, I had the outside lane to Sydney McLaughlin in that race. And I think that was kind of a huge focal point uh, that at least the announcers kind of talked about. And for me, it was just kind of like natural. I think in training, I'm always the athlete on the outside. And I think we do that because my training partners, you know, they're younger than me. They're they're more new to the scene and this this kind of how we like to train. I think it's for all of us to kind of get the most out of our training. So for me, it was very, very natural to kind of be on the outside and kind of set the pace, but um, yeah, so this, to, to set the pace. So um, yeah, it just kind of went as planned. I know my reactions are never what people want them to be, but <laughs> it's just, I think it's just internal for me. Yeah. Um- so you, you now obviously have the two fastest times ever, and I think you you also own maybe the ninth or the tenth fastest. So you you have three of the top ten fastest times ever in your event. How does it feel to be like it's it's one thing to be an Olympic like to be an Olympic champ is is obviously an incredible feat, but to the, be to be the best that's ever competed in the four hundred hurdles, like obviously it's not something you sit around thinking about all day every day. But how does it how does it feel when you do reflect on that? I mean, I guess it honestly feels, I guess, um, unbelievable almost to the extent. I think sometimes, I, like you said, you don't sit around and think about it every day, but it's those moments that you do think about it, especially when you put it in terms of having the fastest two times ever run. It's, it is those moments where you're like, wow. And I, like I said, even before, it's kind of like, how did that even happen? Like, <laughs> it's like, I, I don't think as a child that I really thought that that was possible. And it's only as I, you know, had started doing accomplishing other things that I wanted that to be a goal and but I don't think it ever really was a goal I didn't even know that something like that was achievable and 
Yeah, for crazy enough, though, it makes me want more. <laughs> well, like, you know, speaking of more, um, there's always another goal, right? And and especially, I mean, for you, if we look ahead to Tokyo 2021, no woman has won, has defended, you know, the gold in the 400 hurdles. So that obviously another opportunity to, to be to be first there. Is that what is that what's pushing you forward now? I don't know. You just told me that. I didn't know that. So Right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> but that's definitely something. And I love when people tell me that. Sonia was the one that told me that um, no American had ever won the 400 meter hurdles. And that definitely pushed me to, to win gold at the 2016 Olympics. So I love to learn to know things like that. Um, it definitely is it's helpful. It makes you more motivated. Beyond, beyond the possibility of, of, of Tokyo 2021, <laughs> When you, again, when you set world records, when you've won Olympic gold, how do you set challenges for yourself? Is it more around, you know, you've spoken before about leaving a legacy in the sport and, and wanting to be known as the best that ever did it in your event. And, and obviously as it stands right now, you're there, but how do you set career goals now? I guess for me, it's not only about the career goals at this point, you know, obviously I think. I've said it before, I think it's possible to dip under 52. So for me, that's definitely still a goal. I would love to do that. Um, but also it's it's more, I think, so, more so. I think I look at the younger generation, and I mean much younger um, little girls and what they're, what they're going to see. And I think for me, that's what drives me to keep going now. Um, I recently just posted a video, and this wasn't even about track and field, but a little girl like, um, something that she did in soccer, just like a crazy move that she was capable of doing. And I just find that so inspiring when I watch little girls that are ch- achieving something so grand. And I guess it's kind of like a vice versa. Kinda, well, not a vice versa, but me looking to them and them hoping that they also look to me. So, yeah, I think that's kind of what drives me forward now. You know, it's it's cool to think that we started seeing in the last couple of weeks, like um, a lot of messaging around the LA 2028 olympic games and you know you yourself living in in los angeles you know the 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 winners of the 400 hurdles in la 28 could be looking at you right now getting inspiration you know like that's that's kind of cool to think about what you're doing for that generation yeah absolutely it's so cool and i'd love to you know just reach out and so because i just know what it's like when you're that age and i think now that i'm at this point in my career it's like i just (laughs) You want to give back. You want so much of the knowledge that you've gained in the sport and just as a woman and just going through life and you just know what it's like to be them and who you were at that age and what you were looking at and hoping that you can inspire. I want to talk a little bit about um, your relationship with your coach. Um, Pardon me. Lawrence Johnson, you said before, like credit so much of your progression and development um, to him. What's the, what's the, What's the dynamic like day to day in in training? Like you said, you're pretty focused on just like nailing your splits perfectly. Are you uh, are you a good student? Uh, is that how you put it? Are you are you a good uh, yeah? Are you are you a good pupil for your coach? I mean, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah, I think you know. Honestly, I you know, it sounds like when I when I express our. Uh, to you and it kind of sounds like we kind of have this like real strict you know set plan and that's honestly (laughs) not at all how it is at training that's just me he's like the complete opposite we're definitely opposites in that regard I mean he definitely likes things like done a certain way but he's definitely a lot laid back listening to music having a good time he's telling jokes um so we're definitely having that kind of just friendship I think at training um but we also get the work done so I think that's kind of a good way to kind of summarize, I guess, what our atmosphere, our training is like. Um, But one thing I do really like and why I kind of credit just so much of my success that one thing I do love about my coach is he really um, takes into what I'm feeling and my feedback. And he definitely uses that to um, improve my training. And he's really, like, he really believes in what I'm saying. He really trusts what I'm saying. And I think um, I like that we have that relationship where he definitely trusts me as an athlete and what I'm giving back, what what feedback I'm giving to him. There was something he uh, he said again. It was I think it must have been in that Sports Illustrated article from um, you know September 2019. 
where he's sort of reflecting on your Des Moines run, he sort of said, you know, I think in the perfect in the perfect race, maybe like a 51-8 is possible. Did you read that or hear that and think, come on, man, like I've just set the world record and now you're talking about 51-8? Like, come on. No, I didn't think that. I think we've <laughs> kind of talked about that in our training. So it's definitely been something that um, trying to make it possible and me giving my feedback, you know, I think honestly we're a little bit, um, what I think is possible, how I think we should run the race and how he thinks he, we should run the race to kind of run 51-8. And that I think we kind of differ. I think his way is a little crazy and I think my way might be <laughs> a little bit more <laughs> doable. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I normally, when it's like the day of the race, I always kind of have my own idea, but then I like have to look to him and ask him like, what race plan do you think is the right one? And I always go with his because... He hasn't let me down yet, so why change it up? Yeah, it's it's working. Um, when we when we look at okay, having run the two fastest times ever, and we talk about trying to improve further on that, you, you're obviously you're already at the top of the game. So now trying to trying to improve, you know, we're talking about like the tiniest little improvements, right? You know, season on season and year on year. Does that require? You know, does does training and and preparing and being the best athlete does that require more mental energy now than it did? You know, coming out of college in two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen. I think. Well, I don't know if I. Yeah, it does. I think you know, it's definitely the mental will get you a lot further than physically. I think that um, if you're mentally able to just kind of keep it together and mentally able to do the training day in and day out, it'll you can kind of even, that'll even help compensate for even lacks of in certain areas if you're mentally, really mentally strong. And I strongly, strongly feel that way. So um, that's kind of what I think kind of helps me in the 400 meter hurdles and what's how I'm capable of winning certain races. So yeah, I definitely think it's mental. So, and I definitely, I think it took me some years to kind of figure that out. And sometimes even as I'll go back to my college days, I remember just feeling so down about like races and kind of feeling like I didn't want to run them. And I think when I kind of found that mental like um, strength that it changed just my outlook on running in general. And it's just like, you kind of realize it's not that you're, you don't want to run. You're just unhappy with your performances or things like that. Um, so yeah, definitely mental. You, you mentioned recently that, um, you know, with a bit more time in, in 2020, you've been sort of, uh, I don't know if reconnecting is the right word, but, um, something interesting I found you said was you've, you've been connecting more with other athletes. And one of the athletes you mentioned was Donovan Brazier, who himself, you know, 800 meter, you know, prodigious talent, American record holder, you know, it hasn't necessarily achieved all the same accolades that you have, but certainly seems to have a lot of expectation placed on on him. How important is it for you to be able to have, you know, people in your peer group that you can talk about training and life and pressures and all those sorts of things with? I think I didn't never even realize how important it was, but to have that now, I, I, it definitely makes a huge difference. And that's why I even love talking to Donovan. We've met on the um, Diamond League scene and we kind of just connect and I just see how similar that we are and I love that he trusts my opinion on stuff and I think um, so I love to give that back to anyone and just kind of athletes when you've kind of gone through certain well you've gone through all these years of running you kind of know the scene number one and you kind of just even you you gain a lot of knowledge about things that you had previously no care about, like injuries, for instance, like, you know, like, like things like um, those type of things. So it's like you just you gain a lot more knowledge than you even realize. And to just kind of give that back to people is definitely something that I love doing. And I think just having that also support um, to kind of know that other athletes are kind of going through what you're going through. And it definitely just having that community of athletes definitely makes a huge difference difference in your mental and yeah your longevity in the sport um and and that's probably i mean there's this probably as we do get into tokyo um and a lot of a lot of your peer group are probably heading into going to be heading into their first olympics you're probably going to find yourself you know getting more and more questions from from people as someone who's been there and done it and won gold you know like 
it's interesting without even realizing it, you, you suddenly become the person like dishing out the experience and the wisdom. I know. I know. It, it definitely feels that way too. I remember going to my first Olympics then asking, I think Allison Felix at the time, I asked her, I'm like, we were, me and my coach was debating on whether or not we would go to the opening ceremonies. And I really wanted to go, but our race our first round was like very soon after the opening ceremonies. And I'm like calling her like, Allison, what do you think I should do? So um, and now I'm that person. I'm like, oh, OK, it's it's just you You get older. You're like, I used to be the youngest. Now I'm the oldest on the scene. How did that happen? I don't know. But <laughs> it's it's all good. You um, now you also said recently on a podcast and this this blows my mind, you said um now that you have a bit more time on your hands, you said you even have time to answer DMs and you said like, <laughs> you know, if people want advice about running or training, like just send me a DM, I'll get back to you. Did that did that blow up? Like I can only imagine what the flood of DMs looks you like. You know there. it. <laughs> I don't, if, I don't, okay, sometimes you say things, you kind of forget, but now that you mentioned that, that <laughs> would explain a lot of what's going on now. Um So I guess to answer your question, yes, but I, yeah, so I do, I I am answering (laughs) back DMs when it's track related. (laughs) You, um, you know, like it, it seems obvious just based on, on your talent, your achievements, you're an incredible role model for young athletes everywhere, right? Regardless, regardless of gender and regardless of race, but, you know, also, especially for black and Muslim girls, um, how how aware of that are you and kind of again like you know, go back to that question in college did you ever think you know as a as a first or second year athlete at USC that okay one day I'm going to do all these things but maybe even more importantly than that I'm going to be this amazing role model for you know young girls just like me no I didn't I don't think that ever crossed my mind and I don't think it really even crossed my t- my mind until possibly the Olympics in 2016. And I started realizing how, well, for one, I was getting asked a lot about my religion. And up until that point in my life, it's not that I denied it or hid my religion, but I just never really spoke about it. I mean, I think for me, it was like, clearly my last name is Muhammad. My first name is Dalila. <laughs> Um, to me, to me, it was obvious, but it's not something that I spoke about or put into the world, I would say. And as I was getting asked all these questions, I initially almost felt uncomfortable and, and I had to kind of reflect onto why I felt that way. And I think for me, it was kind of that realization that I don't see a lot of Muslim women and that are, that look like me that are portrayed in the media and, in some regard, it made me feel like I, maybe I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, and as I kind of broke out of that and kind of felt more comfortable, I guess, in my own skin and really wanted to just share to the world to the, who I am and how important that was. And I started even noticing seeing other girls more like that looks like me um, doing the same thing and just feeling I guess a sense of pride and just kind of wanting to be a part of that community. You know, like when we when we think about, um, you know, motivating people and inspiring people, the majority, you know, the majority of us, um, we've done a good job if we can inspire our family or our friends or, you know, somebody to pick up a good habit or to, to do something positive for themselves. And like, you know, I was thinking about this recently with yourself, like, you know, there, there would be, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of um, Muslim parents talking to their, you know, their black and Muslim children right now in the US and pointing out you and saying, hey, this is, you know, there's no ceiling on what you can achieve and this is the potential. And like, that must just be an incredibly special feeling for you. It is. It is. I think, you know, what's so special to me is the feedback that I receive. I think so. It's very easy to believe that people might give negative feedback and, um, seeing that I don't um, cover my hair or sometimes I'm, you know, not dressed, I guess, in the traditional fashion of Muslim women. And and honestly, my experience has been the complete opposite. And I'm so thankful for that, of just the, the positive feedback that I receive. And I always love to hear those um, because that just really makes me kind of, 
I guess for one, I enjoy to hear it, but also it just puts me in a good headspace. So definitely love to kind of hear those stories. And I definitely receive more positive feedback than anything. All right, Dalila, we're going to move on to a couple of, uh, we're just going to finish with a couple of fun sort of questions now. All right. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, Outside of running, we we occasionally get these little glimpses, whether it's on your social media or, um, you know, other little appearances that you're doing. We get these glimpses of you outside of sort of typical athlete, athletic apparel, right? And you always just got these fire outfits on. Is uh, is fashion a big, like, is that a, a big, strong interest for you? Is that something we're going to see more of? Are we going to see more high fashion shoots one day with Dalila Muhammad? I hope so. I definitely hope so. Um, I, it is something I'm really, really passionate about and definitely interested in. I'm signed with four models, so I definitely, you know, hopefully we'll see some more kind of high fashion things done in the future. Um, yeah, I'm going to post more too. I like, when I'm with friends, they're always asking me like, why don't you post like every day what you wear? Uh, and I'm like, I just, I just don't. Like, I'm not even into taking pictures like that, but as a Ford model, I guess I need to, right? So definitely, definitely more to come. And you got the time to be posting stuff now, right? I do have the time. I do. <laughs> I do have the hey, time. Hey, speaking, speaking of downtime, speaking of couch time, couple of questions we always like to ask what's in your what's in your youtube history right now if if uh if we went through your youtube watched videos what are you spending time on oh man i'm definitely a big youtube person i watch everything um i'm like one of okay so a lot of track a lot of um track related videos i think i just watched lena irby her winning a 200 meters um against daphne skippers i just watched that last night I watch a lot of random stuff. I watch this random video um, about deaf and blind and these um, communicating and how they communicate with each other. I watch kind of educational things. Um, <laughs> what else do I watch? I watch, honestly, mostly track and fields, but and every now and again, I watch something random. Definitely random, completely so random. You know, that's interesting, actually, because, you know, athletes – from from like athletes I speak to seem to fall into one of two camps. They either, when they're not competing, they don't want to know about track and field and they just want to shut it out. Or there's people who are always consuming track and field and like, you know, just students of the sport. And you're obviously, uh, you're obviously yeah. someone who loves it. Yeah, I'm definitely one a person that loves it. I just, and also I like to know the people on the scene. I think it's, it's important to kind of know who you're going to potentially kind of be on teams with. So I definitely just like to see what they're doing. I think when we go to these like big championships meets, it was kind of sometimes you just don't know anyone, honestly, other than the people that are in your ex exact ev event. And I always didn't like, and I never liked that. So I just want to know everybody and know what they're doing so I can just cheer them on. What is the most used app on your phone? Instagram. Yeah. I think that's everybody's. <laughs> <laughs> and I play phase 10, which is a random, terrible habit. So the card game. <laughs> what? Um, okay. Especially, I mean, this is a good off season question coming up, right? So it's off season. It's a Friday night. You, you're settling in for some like Netflix or whatever. What's your, what's your go-to snack food in the off season? Oh, well, this is my always Popcorn. That's like my go-to kind of thing. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're not into popcorn? <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> I do I like, know. you know, I, I'll, get, I'll eat like, you know, every now and again, I'll get sweets. I'm not a huge sweets person, but I do love cinnamon buns. So, and I have, a, I live across the Ooh. street from a mall. So I eat that. Um, but other than, yeah, popcorn is really my go-to. Um, that's literally it, to be honest. I, I don't even really snack other than that. Oh, okay. See, I'm like... Salty snacks is like a before dinner thing, but then after dinner, it's sweet stuff for me. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, I like to eat the sweets first. I'll eat the sweet thing and then I'll eat something and I'll finish it with something salty. Like I can never just have a sweet thing. All right. Final question for me. I'm really curious about this. What does your, like, what does your gold medal look like four years on? Is it like is it all scuffed up? Is it covered in fingerprints? Is it like bits missing off the off the ribbon? Like how's it is it is it in good shape? Um, you know what? Okay, so after receiving the gold medal, I did drop it. 
And so, <laughs> but after I dropped it, I'm like, I'm never ever touching it again unless I absolutely have to. So since then, it's sat in the same case. So I'm guessing that it looks exactly the same. <laughs> when, uh, you know, when, when do you think you'll, when, when will you go and revisit that? Is that something before Tokyo you'll, you'll, you'll take it out and check it out again? Well, I'm probably going to do it after this phone conversation now that you thought about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm actually going to do it right now after this dinner because now I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, no, you don't, want, you don't want popcorn hands on a gold medal, no, though, I don't no. think. It's, uh, <laughs> stay away from that. Hey, uh, so, so fortunate to chat with you today, Delilla. Enjoy the rest of your off-season and whatever the rest of 2020 has in store for you, good luck with it. Thank you so much for being on Running Things today. Thank you. So good talking to you as well. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. It was amazing to chat with Dalila Muhammad. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I don't get super nervous for many of those interviews, but it, it's certainly like somebody with her aura around her as a gold medalist and as a world record holder. It was just really special to chat with her. It doesn't stop there, though. We keep this coming every single week. Next week on the show, we have Sprint Sensation former collegiate standout Shikari Richardson on the show. If you don't know much about Shikari, we will drop links to her social profiles and some of her performances in the show notes so you can check that out. If you're not already already following Dalila Muhammad, of course, we'll drop some notes to her Instagram profile and also some articles. I, I, I've referenced the Sports Illustrated article a few times in the interview. We will drop that in the show notes as well as some other readings so you can get familiar. Following Shikari, I think we have some pretty special names lined up after that as well. We have Craig Engels lined up on the show, of course, as well as our London Marathon preview with all the Aussies competing in London. So again, if you're not yet subscribed on YouTube, do that. Or if pods are your vibe, make sure you're subscribed there as well. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next time and uh, take your easy days easy. Thanks so much for watching Running Things here on YouTube. If you haven't already, do us a favor, hit that little subscribe button. It really helps out our channel. Also, tell your friends and don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Tempo Journal.